just want to welcome the panelists and our moderator and thank them for participating. And at the IIA, we're engaged in a three-year project on the future of Europe. And these public debates are taking place around the country, and they're part of that project. And it's really looking at Ireland's role in the changing European Union once the UK leaves. So this is the fourth event. We've had ones in Cork, Dundalk, Maynooth, and now we're delighted to be in Waterford tonight. So I'm going to hand over to Eamon to take you through, and we hope you enjoy the discussion and take part in the Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Hannah. Can all of you step the back? <laughs> you can. All right, listen, you're very well. My name's Eamon Keane. I present the Data Today program on WLR. Um, and we have assembled, I think, some really, really interesting minds with different opinions, which I think is essential. Um, and the format tonight, basically, I'm going to give each of the speakers between three and five minutes, I suppose, to lay out the start of what they feel is particularly important in relation to our topic tonight, which is, if I were to try to sum it up, would be, how were you affected? Because you're you're all citizens of this country. How are you affected um, in a post-Brexit world? What's it going to be like? And we get a nice span of, I suppose, experience. Um, I'm Grace sitting beside me, Senator Grace O'Sullivan, uh, elected to the Shannon in 2016, as many of you would know, um, has been a number of key office committees, but the environment and ecology. And I was thinking this morning as I was driving over and I often stop up uh, at Bay Beach and there's a bit of plastic washed up. I was thinking, yeah, this is relevant for tonight. You know, EU directives on, on single-use plastic and different things like that. It hits every bit of our lives. So tonight's not going to be an intellectual discussion. It's going to be about how are your lives affected. And I really thank the, uh, the Institute for allowing us to do it that way, and, and they were keen to do it that way too. So Grace will be looking at that from a number of fronts. Um, we have the president of the Water Institute of Technology, so Willie Donnie, Willie, good to have you on board. Uh, we've had many debates in the radio, strong ones, combative ones, uh, and we're here again. And I think it's worth remembering as well that uh, uh, Willie is on the, the Irish representative on the European Member State Future Internet Forum. He's also a founding member of the European Digital Enlightenment Forum, and he's a member of the European Research, Innovation and Science Policy Experts, a high-level group. <coughs> So um, we'll accept Willie's CV tonight, I think, he, <laughs> I think he gets the gig. Uh, we also have uh, a great Waterford man, and you know, we're delighted to have Kieran Watch, who's managing director of a fantastic newspaper, The Monster Express, one which we frequently uh, use <laughs> as a source, and hopefully all his credit. It's, it's a great newspaper. He's 20 years senior ex management experience, but also uh, Kieran has many different hats, for those of you who know him, one being director of Waterford's chamber, since 2012, and he sits on the Jobs, Enterprise, and Innovation Policy Advisory Panel. But he also has a lower of knowledge, which is just beyond any CV. Um, and then, uh, delighted to have Keen Stephanie and Keen McCarthy, a senior researcher with the Institute. I was talking to Keen earlier about Europe, and you know, we all see things like Merkel stepping down or what's going to happen with Theresa May, we should get it through, you know. And talked to Keen beforehand, he's able to marry the wider policy things happening in Europe, in different countries, Eurosceptics, with that down to our real politics as well. So I'd be fascinated to hear what he has to say as well. When they finished giving their opening address to you, about three to five minutes, we'll then have a discussion among the panel, between 25 minutes, maybe half an hour. And then we're throwing it over to you. So if anything comes up as we're speaking, if there may be something which you've thought about long before this, you know what, I really want to raise this about the European project, or whatever it is. Do feel free, put your hand up, uh, and uh, we'll bring the microphone around you. Is that okay? All right. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to ask uh, Grace to begin um, her address here at the, Euro the European Institute tonight. Thank you, Raymond, and thank you, Hannah, and thank you to the Institute for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak tonight and most of all thank you to you for coming to this event um, and taking an interest. Um, as it happens, um, I'm uh, the Green Party candidate for the European elections that um, will take place in May uh, 2019. 
Um, I'm the only candidate, so uh, the nomination has taken place, and it, next um, uh, Saturday I will receive the nomination of the Green Party. So um, with that in mind, I, I feel it's a really good time for me to be here to speak about European affairs and um, community involvement and um, uh, Europe in uh, an Irish context. And um, Europe, I suppose for me, uh, I, I stood in the 2014 European elections and it was like a baptism of fire. Um, it was uh, a very, uh, like a crash course in trying to learn uh, what and the European Union is how it functions, um, and uh, that in itself was, was absolutely a uh, fascinating process. But it is something that I wish everyone uh, and every citizen at the age of 18 would have a, a run at the European elections in order to get your head around what um, Europe means and what the opportunities are for us uh, here in Ireland. So um, uh, I see Europe uh, as the primary body which Ireland can have its voice heard on a European and a global level um, and uh, in Europe and in addition um, in the United Nations. So uh, we are a relatively small country in terms of uh, population size. Um, we're also uh, an island nation which makes us somewhat different to um, a number of other European countries and uh, countries in continent Europe. Um, but uh, I feel that together we're stronger. So I would be someone who um, sees the opportunity of being part of the European project or the European Union as um, something uh, where we as a nation add value to who we are and that uh, we get a, a, a return in cooperation, collaboration, um, and um, in, in knowledge transfer, expertise, um, so for me, I would be uh, see myself as a strong proponent of our membership of the European Union. Um, that's not to say that I'm not listening and I'm not aware of the concerns of uh, European citizens, but particularly uh, people that I meet here in Waterford, Tremor, um, around the South East and in my uh, job as a Green Party Senator. Um, and uh, what you know, I hear is um, that uh, people feel that disconnection with Europe um, and, uh, and that's a problem. And that's a problem in terms of how uh, we in Ireland uh, communicate with regards to Europe and what it offers. But also from a European uh, Union perspective, um, I would say that um, there is a problem in terms of communicating what can be done uh, as partners in this big project of 28 currently, um, and uh, possibly 27 within a few weeks. And the Greens uh, have always had uh, been a strong and uh, coherent force at a European level pushing for change, uh, for a more democratic union that listens to the voices of the citizens and, um, and involves citizens in uh, the daily work of the Parliament. Um, so this has meant pushing for increasing the power and influence of the European Parliament, uh, for opening up uh, legislation and decision-making processes uh, of the EU to be more transparent and uh, that we have greater uh, scrutiny. And it means seeing the Union um, more than just the sum of its parts, um, not just being a, a group of governments coming together to make trade deals, but rather 500 million citizens sharing and advancing common beliefs and ideals in terms of democracy, inclusion, reason and peace uh, forming. And the Green Vision uh, is one of Europe as, uh, uh, Europe as a force for good, whether it's improving environmental sustainability, tackling climate change, advancing disarmament or promoting peace internationally. And that is um, not the reality of the EU entirely as yet, but it is the aspiration and the dream and the vision. Um, and then uh, EU is currently at a, a crossroad and the elections next year threaten to see here, potentially uh, a generation of extremists who want to undo much of, uh, of what the European Union has done thus far uh, since the end of World War II. So participation in the European elections has declined uh, over many years, but in fact uh, in 24 there was a tiny recovery, uh, which is positive, but it was small. 
the challenge is to communicate what um, I um, see. A, it's a complicated process because of the size of, um, of uh, the, the, the European Union and the different countries and the complexities of language and that. So it isn't an easy task, but it isn't unsurmountable. So just, um, I suppose, to uh, uh, sum up, uh, for me, it is the European community of people, of citizens, and that if we can work collaboratively and well together, us as Ireland, in the European context, then globally we create a better environment all around. Right. Thanks to Grace O'Sullivan. Um, I'd also like to welcome tonight, we have our Mayor. Is Declan here? Declan, our Mayor of Declan. Here's Declan, yeah, the likes can see it. And we might hear from Declan shortly after this as well. Thank you, Mayor, for coming tonight. Um, one of the main things, I suppose, about Europe is, <laughs> someone's put at me cruelly in the shop, like, what are we getting out of it? They got a lot from us, fishies and so forth, and that's always the debate. I suppose one area, maybe, where we've gotten something is funding for research. And we've seen here in Waterford, particularly, uh, with Crystal Valley, some of the success of the companies from WIT, that that can have huge spin off effects for everybody. And I think it's appropriate that we have Professor Willie Donnelly with us tonight, who might look at some of those aspects, um, particularly what's coming down the road for us and can we draw more from phones like Horizon and things like that, Willie? Well, you're making the point that you were in Europe again a number of years ago. Yeah, I was saying 1989, and I thought my time was up there, I was being called home. But, um, the, yeah, I started in 1989 and it was actually on a European research program and the fact was that we had very little money in 89 and we relied on Europe and most of the research funding that came to Ireland during that period up to about 2002 came from uh, Europe, also an invest investment in our current level institutions and people who have graduated from particularly from the Institute of Technology got grants from Europe. So the European, European uh, impact on this country in particular and in the evolution of this country from being a low cost manufacturing economy to what we are today, Europe has played a major role in that. Now one of the areas um, I'm looking at at the moment is the whole idea of where does Europe go in terms of economic convergence, because this was part of European policy for economic convergence. And the great success story for Europe has been that uh, through the structural funds, that commitment from econo economic convergence. But Europe is at a bit of crossroads now. And the reason is that the, you know, Ireland as a model, as an ideal model for, you know, the success of European investment. And then we have the, uh, the new if you like, countries in Eastern Europe coming in. The problem is that the models that were used in the old economy, if I can call it that, don't apply to the modern economy because today what we have is a digital economy. And in the digital economy, it's a global economy. So protectionism that would allow, we say, peripheral regions in, in, in Europe to slowly grow and take investment from Europe, they don't have that opportunity anymore. So really from a European perspective there's a shift and there's a, this shift is causing huge disruptive effects in, in, in Europe because the emphasis now has not to be on investment in, uh, in physical infrastructure but investment in knowledge infrastructure and research is a key part of that. So what we're looking at now and what Europe is trying to deal with is how do you move forward to peripheral regions in a globalised economy? How do you invest in economies that can transform them from the old manufacturing to the knowledge economies? And this takes a new way of thinking and a new approach, but it also takes, and maybe this is the difference that we're seeing um, in terms of our own relationship with Europe, it also takes a shift in the way we do business as a country. So. Um, you know, we're very well used to the idea of innovation and economic innovation. But in this new digital economy, we need to balance economic and social innovation to create a more sustainable uh, society, okay? And that requires, and I'm really turning it back in a sense that if, we've been, if we are successful going forward in Europe, the thing is our own structures in terms of how we do government, how industry and education 
uh, uh, engages has to be much more open, okay? So what I would say is this kind of new disruptive economy, the globalization of this economy, a lot of the stuff we've seen in Europe and the rise of right wing unionism, the rise of kind of the frustration from the new and emerging states are coming from that. So what I would say is, um, you know, Europe uh, in a globalized economy, uh, it's important that Ireland is at the heart of this uh, new economy. And I'll, go, I'll, I'll talk after Ian about some ways that that's impacting on us, and some ways, for instance, that we need to respond. But my, I suppose my open statement is that the European model is changing, and it's been changed because of the nature of the type of economy we, we uh, live in, and that creates challenges not only for you know, Eastern Europe and other areas, but even for us and the sustainability of our own society. Okay, so thank you, Willie, for that. Um, next, we have uh, Kieran Mach, Managing Director of the Monster Express. Uh, I was talking to Kieran beforehand, and you know, again, singing our program, when we discussed Brexit, we thought, oh, look, there'd be a huge turnout, and the text flooded in, and people are going, you know, I we would want in from a uh, producer, food producer, more for going, what's going to happen to me? Um, and I, when you read the Monster Express and some of the stories they cover, and they celebrate some of those people, but there are implications in, the, in this new European order, if you want. So, what do you think, Barry? I say, well, I guess we've got to keep relationships going with as many people as possible post Brexit, and uh, particularly with our neighbours in the Northern Ireland, we're so close to them, so it's not going to help relationships, but we still are friends and neighbours, and we need to say we're in and we need to stay friends. But we also need to build relations more with the Nordic countries, with our old and former allies like France and Spain, where, who helped us in the past in, our, in history and struggles with the UK in the past. But I just thought really of maybe we could have a new type of gathering here. Mm. That we could have, like we had in 2011 12, where we get people to kind of come visit Ireland, come and do business with Ireland, because we're getting shafted a little bit here. Mm. And maybe we might get more support there. It's just a bit of an unusual idea, but who knows? Um, we could appeal to the US on this one. We could also encourage the Americans to come over, come over and maybe trade with us more and help us out in these, in these circumstances. And they might prefer us more than basing themselves in the UK. Um, and to go to Willie's point, um, perhaps we need to engage more with European projects that was over there in October. And the EU Commission people say we're not applying enough for, for funding projects. It could be research, it could be the carbon economy, climate change, the smart economy, smart agriculture. The Irish government isn't putting enough emphasis on it. And uh, there's money available, but they have to match it. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're not, they're still in the recession thinking a little bit, mm -hmm. and sit, trying to save money all the time, but they could be doing more. Um, we also probably have to look at the food situation. Like Britain has been a great place for selling our dairy and beef, um, but you know, we might be able to sell as much in the future, and they'll be getting full aid from the States or Canada, and, um, you know, so where are we going to sell our food? Cheddar might be really be a seller in Europe, but we can sell our beef at premium prices. So, you know, we could, we could do more there. Um, here in Waterford, we have a port, and um, perhaps we need to be thinking about linking up with France and Holland, just like Belize in the past used to have uh, container ships going from Waterford to La Havre, to Rotterdam and other places. Um, and apparently there's financial supports for that. If we do it, and it would mean bypassing the UK. I was at a talk last week at Price Waterhouse, you know, Julian to get a talk, and there could be a danger of double tariffs. If a, track, if a truck went from Ireland to England and then on to France or Belgium or Holland, they might end up paying twice mm -hmm. if they had their paperwork not in order. So a lot, a lot of time can be lost then. It is an extra travel time. It takes 20 hours nearly to get to Sherwood, but it's, it's faster if you go to England. Mm -hmm. Could have a lot of holdups there, and um, so the land bridge could be like a hard Brexit for us, and get a, a, a double whammy there. And um, there could be a rise in warehouse space in Ireland for, in the future, so maybe we need to be building more warehouses. It's a possibility. Um, we need to engage, as I said before, we need to engage more and have partnerships with our fellow European countries, and um, have more uh, cooperation and work in business together. But um, I was at the economics there two weeks ago, and it was said by Manny Rice for the F Financial Times, or Simon Cooper, he reckons the hard Brexit guys, if uh, it really came to it, 
and the two weeks of chaos is over, they, they swiftly change their tune and they'll be voting to, to continue business as normal and uh, the hard men will have to back down. A bit like a trade dispute in some respects. Yeah. So that was one point made, and maybe there's something in that. Um, another thing that could happen as well, the Scots will be a bit jealous of what we're doing in Northern Ireland, but in their position, they might want to have a vote and leave the UK. So there's a lot at stake here. The farm lobby in Northern Ireland and Scotland are already trying to support Mrs May at the moment. Um, so there we go. We could have a situation as well where there could be migration to Ireland. Instead of going to the UK for jobs from Eastern Europe or elsewhere, they might want to come here. So they're not really prepared for that, but it could happen. Um, education is another area, I was looking at Willie really mentioned it there. Perhaps we need to learn more European languages if we're going to be in this new circumstance. And maybe we should, the kids should start in primary school. And they do in Europe a little bit. My wife is over there, she's a German teacher yeah. in Waterford. She taught them that St. Paul's Primary School one yeah. wow. So maybe that was a pilot project, so yeah. might be worth considering again. So, uh, Twinnings is another area where we have linkages and maybe we need to expand on those and water is linked with Sandra Land in France and now. So there are a lot of other linkages with towns and villages across the country with other parts of Europe and maybe that's worth um, continuing. So that's kind of my right. right. three okay. importance. And um, a few other points to make, but yeah. save, okay. save it for discussion. Kieran, thanks for making yeah. that. Uh, next we've got uh, Keen McCarthy, who I just met tonight, uh, who's a senior researcher with the Institute. Uh, and we are discussing it. It touches on a lot of, of what the, each of our three speakers, three speakers have said so far. You know, uh, you might remember here our referendums, our original votes in it, and is there such thing as a European dream? And talk about the rise of populism and right wingers and so forth. Um, and I know that's some of the things that Kim may address as well. Kim. Hi, Sam. Yeah, I think the idea of referendums is interesting because one of the questions you kind of said at the outset here is, you know, how does the EU affect us? Um, but I think our, an important question as well is how can we affect the EU? And, and in, in another question you asked is what are we getting out of the EU? But equally it is important to ask what we're putting into it. And I don't just mean in terms of money or resources, but also in terms of ideas and, and stuff. And, and that's what we're trying to do at the moment at the, at the Institute of International and European Affairs is this project is supposed to be creating that debate and finding out well, what do actual people want from the EU? Because you know, it's it's one thing to say what what um, politicians want or what economists believe in the EU, but that's not always the same as what the people want. And it's really important to have that debate. Um, and I've actually been doing um, as part of the project of also being knowing each other uh, EU countries, taking part in these kind of events and, and talking to other uh, think tanks and, and people. And it's been really interesting and. And really what I've found is there's kind of two types of debates that are going on at the moment in the EU. Uh, one is, is what basically happened in the UK, and that's um, the question of, you know, do we want to be part of this project at all? Um, do we want to give up a little bit of uh, our sovereignty, which is the, you know, the, the control over, your, over your, the ability to govern yourself? Are we willing to give that up uh, for the benefits? And, and that's an important question that the UK has grappled with uh, a lot, they've decided. Well, the 52% of them anyway decide that they want to leave. Um, and some other countries in Europe are taking that question seriously at the moment. Um, Ireland doesn't seem to be having that, quite that debate. There seems to be consensus that our place is within the EU. We, we, you know, most surveys put that number at more than 90% of Irish people believe that our, uh, membership of the EU is a good thing. But there's another really important debate that we need to have in Ireland and that the IAA is trying to uh, foster. And that is, okay, we're part of this union, but what kind of EU do we want? Um, how much integration do we want uh, along a lot of policy areas? And it's a question that's going to be really important after Brexit, because we've had a lot of support from the other EU27 um, members uh, around the Brexit table, and that's great, but uh, there's going to be some difficult conversations coming down the line for Ireland. And I think it's really important that the government you know, does consult people uh, on these issues. And I just thought maybe I, I, I'd outline a couple of these. One of them is, is in the area um, of defence. Um, you, you mentioned there, uh, Senator, a little bit about the idea of more defence cooperation. Um, Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, was, was quoted for saying uh, she has this vision of a European army, and that brings a lot of alarm bells in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we do have to have the question of 
you know, we're part of this project, if that project is going towards defence, how are we going to fit our own national uh, interests into this? Um, and it will be interesting to find out because, you know, there is a lot to be said for cooperating with other countries uh, to keep our continent safe, but it also, we have to look at how it affects uh, the neutrality that we hold very dear. And the other question is on, is on the issue of taxation. Um, you know, the politicians in Ireland are very consistent, um, particularly government politicians, about uh, the importance of having a low competitive corporate tax rate. And there is a lot to be said for it, and it, it, it does a lot for bringing in foreign direct investment and everything. But um, I don't think it should be assumed that there's a consensus among all the people that that is the kind of economy we want, we want to have. Um, and uh, at the citizens' dialogues, which were organised by the government, um, I think there was a surprising number of people, particularly young people, who said, you know, why are, why are people expected to pay a certain amount of taxes and companies pay less? And, and it is important that we have this debate to decide what kind of Europe we want. Um, and those debates are also going to affect Ireland's place within Europe. Uh, because we could say we're pro-European, but if, if the rest of the EU is integrating at a level that's much different than what we're, we're looking for, we have to see how we fit in. But I do think that fundamentally Ireland's place is within Europe, personally. Um, and I think that Brexit actually, if anything, you know, a lot of people talked about this idea of maybe Brexit will lead to you know, a domino effect and other countries will start leaving. But in Ireland, I think, if anything, it's going to make our place more within Europe. Um, because even though British nationalism was very much around the idea of you know, the old empire and English nationalism, if anything, Irish nationalism is about being not British. And if anything now defines not being British, it's being European. So I think it will be much better in the future to see Ireland, and, and the EU has done that. Before we entered the EU, 66% of our trade was uh, with the UK. Now it's down to about 13%. The EU has, has given us the ability to branch out, to build relationships with other countries, and I just think that's going to get, going to get stronger um, after Brexit. But I really do think it's important that events like this, uh, we, we ask the questions, well, if we're in this project, what kind of project do we want it to be? Okay, Keen, thanks a million. Now, before we go into this question with the, the panel, and um, if our mayor, Declan Booth, wouldn't mind saying a few words, Declan, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. um, um, Thanks so much for inviting me this evening, and um, this is an interesting topic, especially for the last um, couple of months. For the last couple of months of uh, the BA regarding the Brexit and the England saga and where they came from and where they're going to and where, oh, that's going to affect us. But you know, it's a question we should ask is why did they vote to get out? You know, it's, um, um, I think we should get that message to the bureaucrats as well. Um, the biggest, I'd say, temptation to vote to get out of, for England to get out of, of, of England was your too inquisitive and too, they didn't know too much about our business. It's, <laughs> it, 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 well, I come from a family background. Uh, I have, uh, and, you know, some, some people have done, and they'll ask you how you are, and how the, and are you aware now, how the family, and some other people have a nice way of saying, and how the farm, and, it's not that I say I didn't fill it in yet, but uh, the forms to apply for European help that that you um, mentioned there, they're very complicated. The bureaucracy is ridiculous. If we are sharing, if we are, if we are to be members of Europe, you know, it, it must be it must be more simplistic. Um, Grace mentioned the single use of our aim and the LLR meant the single use plastic. That's another um, chest of mine. Uh, I, I, since 1999, I'm assembling and exporting waste down plastic of farms, like bed wrap, pickle, fertilizer bags, plastic containers. And um, that's kind of impossible. The, the Chinese market is up to collapsing, so that's the moment prices are gone from a very profitable population to zero. But that, that, that can't be something like that. Europe are no helpless. And um, the border, and um, you mentioned about um, the European army there, 
I can go back to the Second World War. If if Germany went east, went west instead of east, we were a different world and no, we definitely we were a different England. So maybe you know our neutrality there was very important. And um, I was in I had a, a, a picture up in Vienna for the weekend representing wow, the world competition the green was in, 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 in Europe in, in the innovation. And um, <coughs> the second the European countries, their second and talk language. You know, it, it, it makes us believe how fluid they are. You know what I mean? We were in Austria and just German is their domain I suppose language, but they, they spoke English but we are here. And and uh, you know they have French and they have they have other languages, so that, that's very important that we would um, uh, in primary school give the people of Germany because you're going to first year you get you get, you get a chance to, to study French or, or German. But as you know, young guys now you can give them a baby, you can give a baby, you put your baby a child on a computer, and then they, they, they can teach yourself how to use it, especially if there's cartoons on it. But uh, and on a serious note, though. We are in difficult times. Um, what what can we do about is I, I don't think we can afford anyway. We can afford not to cooperate with Europe. Um, this week now, from my agricultural background cap, there's a single farm payments and subsidies coming. And every bank in Ireland and merchants and, and cream or crops are uh, depending on them checks to pay to pay accounts. So our farmers can't do without what comes. Now the huge expense as Aaron mentioned on the for the huge cost I see first day back in nineteen seventy four three years we you know, our, our fisheries our fishery industry was sold out of money. We did fabulous fishery. We were we were bigger coastline per acre of land than any other country in the world I suppose. And yes our fishing Please, it's depleted, and we are we have no, I suppose, our processing unit there. So, but I have a hundred passport, I can't do it with this. You know, that, that's another side of it. So, I'd like to thank the tank panel for putting their brains together. I'm they're only my top of head interest, and I have an interest in because we have several heads that are affecting us right now. Um, and manufacturing, you know, we, we need to be able to export. And our, our county and our city here, you know, we had a bit of a prize from WIT lately, you know, and I was fascinated with what, how, what, what has been produced and been manufactured here in our industrial estates. And you and I have already saw the broad into manufacturing operations that are exporting most of what they're producing. So we, are, we can't do it. We can't do it without you. Thank you very much, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And our thanks to our mayor there, uh, Declan Ducey, I think raised a lot of very, very interesting points, which I'm sure will be uh, interesting for the panel. Right, so what we're going to do now for the next, well, the next 20, 25 minutes, um, I've made a few notes there as well. There's a few things said there which I wouldn't mind having a look at. And then it's going to be over to you as well, so you can uh, make your notes and, and take in what's being said. There, were, there was so much uh, in all that. If I might begin, uh, really if I can begin with you, right? And you're making the point that um, the protectionism that there was for countries in the early days, so that if you're subsumed into this huge market, we mind you to a degree, but because now of a, a digital economy, such protectionism don't exist anymore, and you say, well, maybe later I'll explain how we might do something. What can be done about that? Yeah, I think that's the key point is the nature of the economy has changed, changed fundamentally. Globalization is, uh, is the key driver at the moment. Um, we're no longer competing in a, in a small pond, we're no longer competing just with the UK, our zone in China. Three weeks ago, Beijing has 25 million people, Shanghai is 20 million people. They are driving, you know, the new, the new economic uh, economy, the new economy, and they are our competitors. Uh, the same is happening, uh, you know, in the U.S., etc., etc. And um, 
the you know the challenge really is that we're a very small country, a small number of people on a rock at the edge of uh, Europe, and we need to be part of this larger uh, community because we can't do everything ourselves. So if you look at technology, and this is my background in, in, in the whole area of, of um, technology and uh, research and innovation. Uh, you know, the drivers that are needed, the disruptive element of technology and our ability to both respond to that disruptive environment and utilize the knowledge that's being created, we need to be part of a bigger community. And, you know, Europe gives us that larger platform in which we can engage. Oh, really, how do we, like, we're, we're a county here, we're a city here in Waterford. Mm. Who in Europe is going to listen to us? And how do we get them to listen? Well, I mean, we, we, we are a small city, we're a city that's well educated, we're a city that have hugely innovative people, we're a city that have fantastic uh, indigenous industries that have grown up. I mean, if you look at, you mentioned Crystal Valley Tech, and you look at the IT industry in Waterford, uh, there's a hundred companies here that were not here 20 years ago, all exporting internationally. So we have the intellectual capacity, we have the innovative capacity, but the point is not so much that. The point is that in the globally, the, the focus now is on sustainable societies. And that means, like when we joined the EU, it was all about economic development. As long as you had a good job, that was it. But now it's about how society organizes itself and the quality of life of that society. Now we don't, as three million people, have the capacity to solve all those problems on our own. And I give an example. Uh, one of the areas I was working in in Europe was in the area of smart cities. And most of the development in smart cities was done in Barcelona and Amsterdam. You know, we should be consumers of those, of that knowledge, and not always see ourselves as being the producers of it. So, what I would say is, first and foremost, is that as part of this European Union, from a knowledge perspective, from a, a quality of life, from a economic development, by participating in the European platform like Horizon 2020, by partnering our, our, our other uh, industries and, and research centres across Europe, we have access to you know the knowledge they, 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 the knowledge pool of 350 million people, yeah. as opposed to 5 million people. So the way I see it is, in a globalised economy, we have to be part of a larger economy. Well, okay. It was interesting, Grace, just a quick one there, because there's something that's arising from that, and Grace, you can come in this, and, and Keen and Kieran as well, and I'm sure all is like, at the moment, it's a good force for one point, six billion went in, but the EU ruled that Apple should pay us back, is it 13, up to 14, 15 billion, whatever. And the Irish government said, no, it just sounds strange, we don't want that money, okay? But because for reasons, because, you know, this, tax advantage and you talk about protecting really the, the core economic, economic model and it seems to me that one of our assets was well hey you can come to a business here at a very low rate um, and Grace I want to ask you as a member of the Green Party should we based on what Keen said that he's meeting young people who are saying well you know why are they being taxed less, tax less than us why don't we get back to our indigenous industry he was a member of the Green Party should we, should we take that money instead of fighting and, and appealing the EU decision? Well, um, I suppose I, I feel that, um, you know, in terms of tax, um, the, the large corporate corporations, the IFIs that come in here, mm. they have a tax advantage. That's why they come here. Um, whether, you know, from an equality point of view, that's fair across Europe. That's the question. Well, but they, they don't think Europe thinks it's they unfair. Come in here. Yeah. They come in here because they have that advantage. Mm -hmm. And in addition, they have good knowledge of the economy. They have high intelligent um, human resources available to them. But um, in addition, uh, they have that tax advantage. To my mind, we should um, take whatever we can get of that money and use it in the, the green economy. And the green economy, I mean, in terms of renewables, uh, smart cities, um, you know, take the best of the intelligence um, in terms of circular economy, green economy, bio economies. So let's say the new age word, the word that will bring us into true sustainability. 
so that we, we are smart in how we are living. So in terms of our housing, we're smart in how we get to work in terms of transport. We're smart in how we deliver. Yeah, but the people economy. might say, Grace, we're not going to be smart if we lose our competitive advantage. And despite the trying it, we still rely to a degree on foreign direct investment, even here in Waterford. And if we alienate those companies, how smart is that? But I, I'm wondering, if we do that, it's only a question, my, uh, my, I, I do wonder, would they actually, would we gain kudos in a way? Because, I mean, we still are offering the lifestyle quality of life. We're still offering, you know, a really, what we have to offer these businesses isn't it in that. So I think that we can play with the level that is there. I mean, at the moment, you know, it's very attractive to the foreign direct investment to come into the country. I think we should look so at... So the Equals Forward says let's harmonise it. Want we want you to have it. Okay, so there's a point made, Keane and, and Kieran, okay, which is this, that while we have a very obvious um, you know, tax base for, for foreign multinationals, the French and other countries, they get their incentives in more slyer, more subtle ways. Why should we be hit? Yeah, or Kieran, yeah. Well, I think the 13 billion, I'd say, maybe put away half the money for rainy day, or you might have to give it to Brussels to one of the European countries. But they could put another half the money into investing in education. Because that's with the tech university could happen straight away. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be reluctant to spend money in this government, get it behind the students. Well, it's in a very complicated, let's go account, quite a complex yes, financial but it system. could be yeah. utilised. Yeah. It seems to be a lot of so invest yeah. right. in education and other areas. Yeah. Keen does not, and what that can said as well there, this idea of EU out there, this bureaucracy, no, they want to come and take our tax. Like, as a risk, maybe we could remind them upstairs we're recording for radio because it's going to be difficult to broadcast any of this, but anyway. And Keen, you know, how, how would you square that circle? How would you do that? Well, on one, on one hand, you know, you asked the question, why would they list there, how would they, Waterford as a city or a region, you know, it's, you know why would anybody listen to them? Um, but I think it's, it's important to see that, you know, not to see the EU as this very foreign, you know, group, one group of people around the table, it is MEPs who are going and representing their people. So people do have a voice at the European table. And a lot of the time, the voice isn't being used properly. People aren't actually engaging in Explain it's not being used. Are you saying some of our MAPs are not using their voice? No, I'm saying, I'm saying that people aren't engaging. People, I would see people don't uh, engage in European politics, for example, to the level in which they engage in national politics. We don't, you know, most people probably are more likely to be able to name their TVs than they are their MAPs. Um, more Whose fault is that? How, how did the EU fail to sell itself? I think there's a two-way thing in terms of responsibility here. I, I do agree that the EU has huge communication problems that have a lot to do with language, size, remoteness, absolutely. Yeah. And we still can't get disclosure on expenses. The, you know, people do have problems with it. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with a lot of the problems with the EU. It's far from, from, from perfect. Um, but fundamentally, I still think that that if, if people don't engage and hold their MEPs there, what do you expect? Of course, of course, politicians and Brussels are going to do whatever they want and there's nobody holding them accountable. And um, it is the role of, of people to hold their politicians and, and um, the, the, the civil servants in the EU to account. And it's really important that people are engaged. You, you mentioned defence. Do you think we should be more integrated? And you know, Fine Gael being criticised and Simon Coveney in terms of European Defence Forces and it's not really that we call it something else. Do you think we should be more integrated in a defence capacity? Well that's a very political question really because it is about you know priorities because on one hand if we do integrate more and a lot of people say you know a lot of people say that the neutrality we have is kind of a little bit fanciful because really we would expect to be protected if, if for example you know, uh, an aggressive country came and, and invaded Ireland tomorrow, we would probably expect that our European partners would help us out. Kenny would, Kenny would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's like, but then again, our neutrality does give us a huge global uh, yeah. thing at the UN, especially. You know, look at the role that Ireland has played in yeah. uh, peacekeeping. We're a very trusted broker. We play a lot of roles both in, in peace deals around the world, in Colombia, and in Israel and Palestine. And a lot of that is because of our our sense of, of being a fair neutral country. So I think, fundamentally, I know it doesn't sound like a real answer, but it is a little question. It's about finding the balance between those two things that are both right. Yeah. 
And Kieran and Grace want to put this chair against something that Declan raised, you know, and for farming community here. For instance, the single plastic use directive, okay, and, and Kieran said, or Declan said, this, this is impossible, the Chinese market's gone. That this is Europe imposing things which, if not bankrupting some people, makes a working life impossible for them. We also have, for instance, the issue of emissions and the, the bogey word fines rather than compliance. How do you, as a Green member, and, and Kieran is a, a managing director of a paper which many farmers read here, okay, well, what do you say to that farming community when they go, well, here's what the EU is trying to do to me now? Um, I suppose two things. One is the emissions. Um, I and mean, we do have, we have signed up to uh, the Paris Agreement, so we do have obligations. And it's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just for the local community and the national, it's, it's an international agreement. So we have an obligation and we have to, to uh, meet that obligation. How we do it, to me, is a matter of communication. So the different sectors, there has to be engagement. The farming community, which is a huge community um, in Ireland and a very important one to our economy, they have to um, be involved in the, uh, let's say, the, the innovative <coughs> techniques that we can introduce to um, to offset. Um, so you're um, saying to a farmer, well, you might lose in this, but we're going to give you something else here. Okay. I was uh, thinking like Rob Cass and Solar Energy. Okay. Let me say, last night yeah. I um, was asked to the AGM of the IFA to run fair, and um, farmers there are saying to me that they recognise that they, at the moment their hearts are too big. And they, they do recognise it, and they recognise the difficulty they're having with regard to uh, uh, having supply of fodder. Yeah. And, and they're the recognising the drought, they're recognising the rains, they're recognising the changing yeah. environment, and they are saying to me that they're on the race to the bottom. So I'm then turning to the government and saying, how are we going to square this up? How are we going to make this work for the farm? And how are we going to make it work for the economy? And then, in terms of our international <coughs> In terms of the plastic, I mean, you, you, you addressed it when, in your opening statement about seeing the plastic on the beach. You know, there is, um, for instance, um, there's huge community involvement in the uh, whole plastic dilemma that's out there at the moment, because we have uh, created I, I, I mean, we, we've, uh, an industry has created, manufacturers have created a colossal environmental crisis when it comes to plastic. We, we really do have a problem on our hands. And when we have initiatives you know, at the moment, like you have um, the Green Schools Project, you have different that so it's working in building awareness and building from grassroots up. Well, we do have a problem, there's no doubt about Great, it. Why should we be penalised when there's 25 million people in China and they do it and they say, listen, we ain't buying into that stuff, we keep producing. Really, I mean, that's an issue. Isn't it? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, we used to dump our plastics on um, China. China's becoming more advanced, rapidly a, a growing economy, and they've actually responded saying, oh, we don't want to be um, plastics. So if you look at, I mean, the, the thing that Europe has invested in is the what they, what they call the uh, global challenges, like climate change, like the environment, right? And you can look at these positively or negatively. You can look at them in the case of, okay, this is preventing us from doing, doing what we used to do. Or you can look at them as an opportunity. And this is, the, at the moment, you know, these directives put uh, the focus on how we do research and innovation and how we find new solutions. And alternatives to plastic is something we have to do. But there's another more important um, debate, and it, you know, if you look at emissions, if you look at uh, environmental and environmental impact, we have a huge opportunity in farming and agriculture of becoming a green agricultural country. The one challenge globally is the challenge of um, producing sufficient, sufficient high quality food and food security. And we're in a country, you know, that has more cows than we have uh, humans, you know. And we have, we have an opportunity. And maybe when we went into Europe in the beginning, rather than focusing on that green element and that high quality food production, we went the other way. So I think the industry in Ireland understands talking to, I mean, I have a, a research project with Chavez, which is, called, which is all around smart agriculture and addressing these areas. 
And I think there's a realisation now that we can produce high quality milk, high quality uh, meat on green open air uh, 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 farm, which factory farms can't produce. And you know, this is what globally people are looking but for. But we're going to have to scale down. I mean, Mary Robinson saying, you know, the huge beef production. And um, Grace mentioned the herd sizes, and we did see with the fodder crisis, like farmers ringing into the show saying, we're, we're, excuse me, we're screwed here, what are we going to do? Admitting there was some element of greed among some, but will you, how would you square that, sir? Well, you see, the part of what we're trying to do in our research is to remove the boom bus cycles. So it's better planning, it's better knowing in advance what you need, it's about investing uh, in, uh, you know, in advance. I mean, these, the thing about um, the, the, you know, last year being a particularly difficult <coughs> year um, in, in terms of the, the climate of okay, the lack of rain and the sunshine. I mean, you talk to farmers, older farmers, they'll tell you that that happened, what, 30 years ago, Declan, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, sometimes we look at, it, at an event that's happening and we say, oh, this is, you know, uh, this is a change that's happening uh, and that we, you know, we're going to have to deal with it permanently. The, the whole idea behind, behind what we're trying to do is to use science to give us better tools to manage the agricultural economy. So that means looking at uh, ways in which you can have less emissions by changing the type of feed you give animals, by looking at how you use water more effectively. So what I'm trying to say is that this is a challenge which Europe is addressing, and you know, through science and innovation, there's a huge advantage for Ireland because we are a green economy, but you know, we need to shift towards a situation where we're using the knowledge to become mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. Just, 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 yeah. 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 And it's done a lot of companies a bit. Yeah. Okay. It needs to be invested okay. a lot of ways yeah. ideas. Keen, I want to put something to you before yeah. we before we go to audience, and it's this. <clears throat> I was reading different comments by some of the leaders in Europe and the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, who was saying these fantasists, naive he called them, who had an idea about European integration. That that's poppycock. And Greg's mentioned earlier, you know. The EU shouldn't be just a collection of trade agreements. But Tusk, the president, seems to be saying that. So what hope is there for this great European dream and we're going to apply to this homogenous unit and they're all together when you've Tusk and the East, and I think particularly what Willie mentioned about the East not having protection, and the rise of right-wingers, the rise of populism. There isn't really any great EU, is there? It's an interesting question because a lot of people, when they're talking about this question, is there such a thing as... A, a real EU, you know, identity or European people, their citizens, for example. Uh, the comparison is usually made to the United States, where you have, you know, a group of states that came together, built a, a federal um, government, and people say, well, why, why can't don't we work like that? Why are they so cohesive? You don't hear that much about states saying, you know, do we really want to be part of America? And, oh, but that doesn't happen in the United States. Um, but you have to really. Think about it in terms of the time frame. The EU, as we know it, was only set up um, in 1992. Um, it's 25 years old. The United States was set up over 250 years ago. Um, and in that meantime, they had a civil war over this very question of, you know, the rights of states uh, versus um, the national rights. And um, it was about 100 years before the Americans accepted the dollar to be their currency. They still have debates over the idea of a national language in the United States. And they've been doing this for 250 years, you know? Uh, so I think that the, the EU needs to be careful to not get ahead of itself and think that, you know, we have an end goal, which is more, um, a more of, a, of a harmonized um, and cooperative uh, union, and therefore we should do it today. You know, it has to be um, done in steps, and it has to be done at a level that people are comfortable with. But it also then, and um, people need to be patient and, and, and find a level of integration that works for the people. Um, because if change happens too quickly, as we've seen with a lot of things, whether it be agriculture, whether it be you know, trade, and um, even though we can agree, most people agree, the kind of trade is a good thing, 
when it happens too quickly, it can hurt people. And, 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 and there was a great question raised earlier, you know, why did? And it's easy to say, which I do sometimes always, the old empire mentality, but large swathes, I think, in Northern England in certain constituencies, people dispossessed, disenfranchised, and saying, we don't want parts of this European dream. They must have had a reason for voting this league. Well, personally, I think that they were conned by, by mostly the British press, but also the British government, and because uh, there, was a, there was a terrible inequality in the United Kingdom, and but that's an issue of government policy, that's fiscal policy, and the UK was the company, or one of the countries that was most against the idea of having more integration of fiscal policy, um, and they are one of the most unequal and slowest growing countries in the EU, and right now. So, I really think that's scapegoating of the EU by British right. okay. okay. So, so this the leads to the, 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 yeah. the EU seems to be a popular topic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, this stage I want to open it up to our audience and uh, just for, because we'll be recording this for those listening at home in Dacia today, it's been a recorded program. Um, anybody who wants to come in there, I'm going to get the mic off the chip. Yeah. And if you just give your name and if you represent a part of your group, you let us know too. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Jason Sturt and uh, my political allegiance is Fianna Fáil and I'm hoping to get a nomination for this European elections. Um, I suppose I want to make a couple of points. Yeah, and if you keep it short, because we don't have time for a long any speech. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Look, um, my qualification would be a big reason for comments, but I also am chairman of the farming organisation, Irish Farmers Designated Land. And just to make a few points on the agriculture, I suppose back in 1998, we had 7.6 million livestock units in the country. Today, up until the start of 2018, we had Seven point or six point seven. Sorry. So it's not the fact that we've too much livestock in the country. It's they're consolidated in in, mm. in areas. The, the other point to that is we have thirty five thousand farmers in this country who have some or part or all of their land designated for the birds and habitats directive, and those farmers have been treated disgracefully by this country and by Europe. Why? Because the designations have been placed on their land. Back we say go back to. The, the barn in 1992, all the way up to the Hin Harrier areas, which would be 169,000 acres of land in 2007. So, have you a question for a panel for based on that, for instance? Well, I suppose the point I want to make is basically when we're looking at climate change, when we're looking at um, our environment and how it comes up coincides with Europe and the new cap, we have to start, we say, uh, ring fencing money for farmers in these marginal areas. <coughs> to mitigate against the climate change because they can't compete on the markets of producing livestock and stuff like that. I suppose on the other area, just one question I suppose to key in regard to the overall European area. We have yet to see as a result of the elections over the last five years what shape the European Parliament is going to take in the different groupings and we've 73 seats and if he's going to move from Britain and there of the three different parties, mainly three different parties in 68. So it's just what, what is his views on the configuration okay, of the European Union. Okay, Keen. Thanks for the Yeah, it's actually very interesting, and, and Ireland's actually getting two of those seats, uh, which, which is a bit, we're going up from 11 to, to 13. Um, but the, the European Parliament elections are really interesting, and it's something that I, I, I you know, um, is going to be one to watch. And one big question is how the French President, um, Emmanuel Macron, uh, aligns himself uh, within the party structure, and, uh, and it is very interesting. Um, but I, I think that you're going to see probably the most likely thing is it's going to be a more divided um, parliament uh, politically. I think there's going to be a bit more on the, on, the, on the left and right, and a bit more division. Um, um, but Grace, the point about that uh, they made was the habitat directive yeah. destroying it, so destructive, disgraceful. Well, it, it's interesting you, you mentioned the burn area because that is one of the areas, Burn Hill, and, and at least Kevin Dunford from Dungarvan did the research and created a great opportunity for the farmers in the Burn region, recognizing the constraint of their land. They um, actually turned the whole situation. They um, created new business, small business like the perfumery, they created true sustainability in the burn. Yeah, so like so that's one that's one area. In terms of that's, that's, that, that's, that's a bit we say it's kind of glorified but over fifty percent of the burn is not eligible for payments on the can. Like there we say if you talk to him, it says um, you don't for, uh, yeah. 
if you talk to them probably about it, like the money they're getting is great and it's a it's an ad, but the overall amount of money they're getting is, is very minuscule compared to the challenges they face in those areas. Okay, and that, that's something for further reflection. Okay. Um, and when you just prepare, yeah, I just want to make a point yeah. that um, when you talk about the habitat and you talked about the impact of farming on the environment, you know, we have benefited from the fact that the Chinese have stopped importing baby formula from New Zealand because of the impact that farming has had on the environment. And the direct beneficiary of that is down the road, is Glambia. So we have to remember we are part of a global economy. People want to know where the food are coming from. People want to know what impact it's having on the environment. And you know, if we don't try to find some true technology, true uh, science, some way of balancing the habitat with quality food production, the rest of the world won't buy our products. All right. Okay. Who's next here? Now? We've got seven people. Give on to all be. And again, just trying to keep it short, maybe in the form of a question. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, Councillor Joe Kelly, Beth Pollard, the Mayor of this area. Well, here, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, I have no real comments on the farming side of it, there's enough people to deal with that. But I'd like to bring this back down to what I would call brass tacks, um, the ordinary man and woman in the street. And we talk about Europe and this great European project, and we have free movement of capital and free movement of labour as being some of the key pillars. Yet in Ireland, we find that our banks charge interest rates and mortgages way above what happens in Europe, and we find that very hard to take are the ordinary people that myself and other councils represent. Um, we also have the, the same thing cropping up when it comes to things like car insurance and so on, we can't debate at that. So it seems to me, and it seems to lots of people have said to me, we avail or we're obliged to follow the whole number of European rules when it suits Europe, but it doesn't suit, we can't avail of any of the benefits such as the ones I've just outlined. Now this is just for ordinary people at ground level trying to manage, trying to manage with the few euros that they have in their pocket. And people, from my experience that I've dealt with, have said to me, uh, the Euro project, in their eyes, is a failure because we take all of the rules, but we don't get those simple kind of benefits, okay. ones that are putting all right. euros in people's sure. pockets. There's a very good question, which maybe we can put right across the panel. Um, if we take, for instance, first the issue of banks and interest rates, where we get huge, and you drag it over, uh, and, and made the point um, and, and tempered it slightly and said this is kind of monopoly carry on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that clear? And um, we come to other points, but, but is, is that a failure of the EU or is it a failure of Irish government's regulation? Yeah, state policy. They're trying to protect the weak banks and give them better margins because of all the bad debts are Are these the weak banks that made billions in profits this year? No, there are weak banks from 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, because I think things have changed slightly. Yeah, well, anyway, they're, they're, they're trying to protect them a little bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They have Can I bring in Rob Cass on that one there? Because you, you were making a point with that as well, Rob. Yes, yeah. just get a microphone there, yeah. Rob Cass, um, North East. I, I have a question on North East. Yeah. Um, that's state policy on interest rates. They're sent by the Irish Central Bank, it's not the EU. So the EU is borrowing rates of 0.4%. It's Irish Central Bank policy. To put the rates to 2.5 percent. So Irish banks are not the most profitable in Europe, and and we use 2.2 billion in profits in Q1. And so it's state policy, not EU policy. Okay. Um, and it's also state policy, Irish state policy on insurance tax. Yeah. Interesting that the EU uh, regulatory it's, it's, divisions it's, it's, came over here and raided the offices of the Irish insurance companies when our own regulators did not do that. Uh, I think that's credited to the EU. Which that's that's right. a communication which is it's being perceived that the EU are enforcing these policies, whereas in fact it's Irish state policy. Yeah, so it's policy. I think right. that the insurance is where they have a combo culture here. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you wouldn't get anything like the yeah. Yeah. But, but here's the great thing about the culture, combo culture though here, and just very briefly, that when you look at the profits uh, of the insurance companies here, and I looked over the 13 year period, I was doing some research on this, and it goes into the billions. And that the compo culture, those awards, yes, they're higher in our jurisdictions, but there hasn't been a massive increase in the total amount. And yet, insurance companies had a huge increase in profits, a huge increase in premiums. I think there's a bit more to the spin which a lot of media buy, holds down to the whiplash. 
why wouldn't they, the blue book, why wouldn't only the central bank see those figures? In Northern Ireland, insurance companies are obliged to publish them. Here they're not. I think it's an easy one for government to get up on. You see, the central law claims, they don't really fight them properly. Mm -hmm. the yeah, and I think that suits them for reasons too. Keen, you want to come in? Yeah, on that point, I would say that that's just kind of a typical example of, of, of it's easier to blame kind of people mm -hmm. than, than organized <laughs> industry. But yes, yes um, you know, there, there isn't the same idea of, of a consumer or a citizen group that, that, that will um, discuss at a policy level with, with government bodies mm -hmm. who are you know, of, of uh, yeah, I think Darty is only knows have tried to do that. Yeah. Okay, no, please. Well, I have to bring a question there, and then I'll come to the gentleman at the back, John, in a few more. Yeah. When we think of the EU, and I'm a big fan of the EU, by the way, in 12 countries, um, in 20 years' time, our kids are going to be impacted by these policies that we choose. So when Willie talks about the digital economy, I want more talk time on blockchain, because that's going to be the last blockchain. blockchain. Okay, explain. Blockchain is essentially solving the problem that has got, which is instead of dealing with tons of bureaucracy and paperwork, it actually makes it all digital. Um, and it's going to be about estimates, so it's going to be about 30% of trade by 2030, which is three times the size of the agricultural community today in Ireland. So that's when we talk about opportunity and risk. The opportunity is for us in Waterford to lead on that through what really does on digital. And then say, how do we apply it first to ourselves to help Decky? and our own businesses, and the farmers that are here. The second is then how do we export that to the largest trading group block, that is the world, which is the EU, and then compete, start to compete internationally against China, against the Middle East, against the US. Because that's collaboration and competition, but we can do that. So I would like to say, how do we apply those ideas, like blockchain, and then I'm on to the second thing about renewables. The poor farmers that have me communicate that in the EU they will fund renewable energy. Sean Kelly, MEP, came here and um, very impressive. He made loans available for farmers to invest in renewable energy. We haven't taken them up. We, Ireland, haven't taken up those loans. Because currently, right now in the southeast, there's about a billion of solar pipeline to be executed, a billion of investment for Waterford and the southeast that isn't being connected. That's not the EU, that's Ireland. That billion investment is 4,000 jobs in the southeast. That is not EU policy, that is state policy. So if I turned around to Deccan and said, would you like 4,000 extra jobs? And would you like, and this is education on, on renewables, Deccan, would you like 10 grand an acre for your, your, your solar farm? Because the EU is backing that, and the EU is funding that. 10,000 an acre, Deccan, would you like that? Hand <laughs> over, please. Yeah. And how we actually apply that? That's right now. All right. Okay. And I, I just want to go, Willie. How, how do you apply that? Yeah, I think we're a smaller country. We're very old. We're the most open economy in Europe, and with the young population, one of the great decisions this government did make was when the, Europe, the Eastern European country, countries came into Europe, we opened uh, our borders for access. To the emerging countries, and we benefited from that. And the UK did the opposite. So, going back to Brexit, it was laying the suspicion of foreigners, suspicion of you know, these hordes and masses coming yeah. in from the, from the east. So, what I would say is we have a huge advantage, and we're not leveraging Europe. Europe. I'll give you an example. Very few people know this, but Irish indigenous companies employ more people in the US than we than a US companies apply in Ireland. I think you didn't know that, right? So we're hugely innovative, we have great uh, startup companies, but why are they all going to the US? Why aren't they going to Europe? Why aren't they now? Europe is partly responsible because it's difficult, and Europe is trying to address this at the moment through um, its policy on open innovation. It's very complex to set up a branch of a company across Europe in different countries. But the, the fact is that we do have a market now with over 300 million people. We are a small economy, we're a highly educated economy, and I think that we have to protect against, you know, replicating the UK models as being suspicious. We've got to keep our borders open. We have to embrace uh, Europeans who want to come here. There's 190 different nationalities living in Dublin. That's amazing. And that is a bit of a power So, what I would say is 
yes, Rob, um, you know, we should be early adapters. That's the other thing I've been trying to say to the government. Why aren't we early adapters of technology? Why don't we apply them in our community before anybody else? And you know, I, I'm going to end talking about, um, you know, uh, Waterford in the future becoming the, the best small digital city in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we can do it. Okay, all right, me to move on. Now, John, there at the back end, I come to ten John, 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 I was just thinking, with the capacity of the first world war, the harvest of everything on the waste of the war. And I was thinking, about 20 odd years ago, we were canvassing it in Toronto, and the house we slipped in had a steel front door, bars on the windows, had a cage on the stairs. We went up in the attic and we slept on beds, and under the beds there were sheets of steel, because the concrete was so bitter at the time. That's how we had to be to, to kept safe. And we had to be brought up in the south that was so we could be safe. So we wouldn't be killed, no. And I'm my big worry is the border. The farmers don't want a border, the, the, the businessmen don't want a border, the nationalists don't want a border, a lot of the, the, the loyalist community don't want a border. And I think to see the, the, the likes of the DUP kind of drag us back that they're going to put a border post, I can't see any scenario where there won't be trouble if you put a border post. Or if you put a customs people, or if you start going with their own to stop people crossing. I can't see any scenario where you won't have trouble there. And I think it's, 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 it's an awful inviting that. But John, do, do you not think that when we take someone like Martin McGuinness, who had that ability to form alliances with the likes of Ian Paisley, <coughs> do you not think that Sinn Féin has suffered from not having a McGuinness, who might step in and say, we need some form of governance here, without blaming the GUP and then blaming Sinn Féin, we've got people here at the most critical time we don't even have our assembly working. Isn't there some onus, um, whatever about the DEP, and that's been highlighted, but on Sinn Féin to step in too, John? Oh, and well, just, just my, my own work in, in, in the city here, I, I was at the, 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 the Royal British Legion of Whiting down on Sunday. I went down to see it. I was a very good friend of Mark McGuinness, and his policy always was. Politics is very simply, I always said. Your, your, their whole thing is to take your people to a better place. And I can't see this whole project of the EU taking us back to anything but a worse place. And the, the other issues I have on it is that... Well, I think that that's a big statement to me. Yeah. I can't see anything this EU project taking. How could the EU project, which has support the Northern No, no, no I mean, I mean, I mean the, the reimposition of borders and divisions. All right, okay. And I think even this... But John, you didn't answer my question, which was this, yeah. is that why doesn't Sinn Féin make an effort to fill that factor, to put aside, you know, which McGuinness and Jayan's did to degrees, to put aside huge, you know, resentment and whatever against the other community and say, for the sake of the people, this is what we need to do now. Get some form of governance going in Northern Ireland. And we could see the Brexit how it was going up around. And we played the long game like we always do. And we can't see a time when we should tell our own sisters in the North of Ireland, or our own brothers who want gay marriage that they should be second class, or that our own sisters that they shouldn't have their rights to abortion. We can't ever stand by anymore and say, you can't be a second class citizen. And that's why I think it can unravel. And I think if, if, the, if the peace unravels, I think our tourist industry unravel. I think the investment will unravel. And that's the huge problem I have with it. I think we've made all the strides. I think people see for what it is now. People who didn't want peace in the first place in the DUP are now in this position where they, the only project they have is saying. John, John, three times I've said, yeah. and it's a very simple question. Yeah. With not one person within Sinn Féin, whether it's Mary Lou, uh, whereas Michelle and say, you know what, we have huge problems with the GUP, the Irish Times, the various things, cash wrap, so But we need to be governing an ordinary now. We need a strong voice. We need an assembly at this critical time. And the very, very point of the whole thing is, at this critical time, the English government have a problem with the DUP, the Fianna Fáil have a problem with the DUP, the SDLP have a problem with the DUP, everybody in the world has a problem with the DUP except the DUP. And that's the problem. The problem is the DUP, that they won't put out the hand and give a quality. There's a thing called people. thinking outside the box, though. If you stay in that paradigm, and anyway, look, I, I better move it on a bit, John. Yeah. Thanks for that. No, just, 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 just two other quick points. Yeah, so, John, John, I can't, for, just because of time. But, John, thanks for your contribution. Yeah. We might raise that in the way to John next week. If you come out and we do that, give it more time. Gentlemen here, sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering there earlier, um, we are talking about the lack of engagement of maybe the average citizen with the European Union. And I was thinking in terms of elections, we do have the European Parliament elections, and they are important, but I think, like you say, it often feels more people that know their TV. They wouldn't be able to name their MEP. 
And I was thinking, is there any scope in the future for um, kind of a cross, uh, a pan-European election of the of the type? Like we have the European Council presidents, we're talking Donald Tusk, as you mentioned earlier, yeah. he's yeah. European Council president, isn't he? Yeah. So that role could be filled by popular election. If it was you know possible to have obviously you'd have to someone with the charisma and mm. multilingual skills mm. who could um, you know campaign across different countries. Okay, let's put that to key. Just, just one of the yeah, key in yeah. Yeah. Well, they do try. They, they're trying to do that at the moment, and the, the, the current, but it's for the European Commission President, not other than the European Council. Uh, the current European Commission President was, was the first time they did it, and basically the, the European parties, which are kind of collections of the national parties, so each, each national party is a member of a European party, and they select a candidate, um, and he's called the lead candidate, or she, and um, they aren't, it's not a popular election in the same way, you know, a presidential vote would be, it's maybe a little bit closer to um, an election for a prime minister where the, the, the person you vote for selects um, their candidate. Um, but you already mentioned maybe a couple of the issues with it, um, although there are a lot of things we said, the issue of language, for example, um, is there any one person that can speak the 30 languages in the EU is a big problem? Um, and Will somebody realistically ever vote for somebody that can't speak their language? Could that be a representative? So those kind of issues are really important. But I think that what the EU is doing right now is actually really great, which is just experimenting and seeing what kind of model is working. Um, and not to be afraid to say, okay, this element of it worked in the last election, um, so, but this didn't work, so let's see how we can rearrange it. And I think that's great because it is still a political experiment, the EU in a lot of ways. Um, but I think you're asking the right question about you know, how can we get people more engaged and, and uh, the EU isn't afraid to say the last elections weren't good enough so let's do it yeah. a bit different. Okay, all right. Kieran, can I just say here, doesn't John Hearn make a very good point that you have this whole huge system and that one, I suppose, minority like the DUP can hold a whole thing up. What does that say about, 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 about the system itself? This is not a very long UK. Yeah. But the whole thing, the fact that the EU and the way it's predicated and the, what the Europe is trying to do with this, Conservatives and there's different factions and SNP and so forth, but for all the grandeur and the might of the EU, that this one group can hold it up. I think you've got to tease out their arguments a bit. I mean, you start with today with the farms and voting yeah. for yeah. and you've got to bring logic to their faces and yeah. get them to put them on the spot yeah. and not to have them just pump out their rhetoric of being anti this or anti that. That they're looking down their own people. I mean, that's what you're yeah, okay. Anybody else there? Jet here at the front, and we've one there, and the lady over here. And we make those last three now because I know we're, we're approaching the finish time. Okay. Of course, uh, yeah. my name is Sean Avery, I'm retired as a servant, compliments to everybody. Hi, I'm Sean. How are you? Nice. Yeah, Thank you very much. Um, but based on my own personal experience, I'd say huge two issue. things. Two things I'd say. Firstly, um, it, it is sad news that uh, Brexit looks like it's going to happen. We're actually going to lose an ally and a friend, and we're going to have an injured trading relationship with Britain. Uh, and, and there, there are also risks down the line about the way in which the common travel area has worked up to now. There's been a huge safety valve in terms of migration historically during bad times here. Think of people like Val Dooming and Ruth Mayer, we're talking about great careers in yeah. We want to keep these things. So I say that one of the things we need to do in the future is rebuild the relationship with the British. Uh, I think there are wounded feelings over there. Mm. Uh, maybe it was unavoidable, but I think we need to look to that. Sean, do you think that Leo Bratton was a bit triumphalist when he came out saying I don't think he intended to be triumphalist, but it certainly played that way in British tabloids. Yeah. To be fair to him, they never miss a chance <laughs> to do that. So I, I, I'll pass over that yeah. if, if I may. I want to talk about opportunity and put something to the panel very quickly. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the superpower of today. Economically, it's probably still the states, but the, the emerging superpower is Asia. We're talking China, Japan, even though it's an Asian society, but it has huge economic power and demand potential for us. And Indonesia, vast populations of people hungry for education and knowledge products from Ireland. Now, I'd like to ask the panel: Can this region capitalise on this emerging superpower and pull some of that power in our direction? And in that specific regard, I would suggest that the single thing that this region could do 
a secure university status to pull in students and academics from Asia. And time is not our friend. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks to me, Sean. Uh, you're, you're a great experience. It's nice, nice to have that view. Great stuff. I go to this and then to Willie. Um, Minister John Hannigan was on my program last week uh, making the point that there's uh, from different provinces in China about 3,000 Chinese students, some of whom, and again, Willie, we have to look at the facility and the infrastructure and the support you need. Great to answer Sean's question there. How, how do we pull that and get into that massive market? Well, I, I suppose one is the pulling and one is uh, the advantage of Europe in terms of Erasmus projects and Science Foundation that export our own people to Asian countries to bring home the knowledge, let's say, get the experience. But, um, no, I mean, it, obviously, if we have the university status, um, it will be more interesting for uh, students to come here because, you know, the IoT, I mean, we're doing really well in terms of... of um, Competency and, and level. But we're losing, I mean, Rob's made that point before, where there's a huge, where it's a knowledge drain, a spending drain, really. We're losing it's it too long. long. We're too long without it. Yeah. It's too long and too short, and I say that carefully, because, um, and I, you know, I, I came to Waterford in 1996, so I've been fighting for university status since I've been there, and it started before me, and we know how that battle has been. But Let's be very, very, very careful. Uh, I am, and the Institute's 100% behind the university, and 100% committed. But unless we have the investment that goes with the university, we're on the road to failure. Because the reality is, we are an Institute of Technology, and we perform way above our, our, our position. In terms, of the, in terms of our research, in terms of renovation, in terms of wonderful graduates. And you saw where we are in the Sunday Times this, this year, uh, head of at least one university. But once you're a university, you have to be a university of international standing to attract the type of companies, to attract the type of students. I just come back from uh, China. What I was doing over there, I was visiting universities, and those universities choose their partners based on the pecking order. And we are very, very lucky because we punch above our ways in the partnerships we have in China because we were one of the first into China. So what I would say is the university is something that we hear clear, loud and clear. We are working hard to deliver the university, delivering it in a timely fashion. But if the investment does not come following that or even before, Right. We are going to experience what the UK experienced. The UK converted all of the institutes into universities, and now we have good universities and we have poor universities. The regions that have poor universities are suffering economically, and a lot of them are in regions where people voted no. So be very clear, and we should be clear to this government and other governments, a university, it, what comes with the university's responsibility to the government to provide the type of investment that will allow the university to be the University of International Standing. Otherwise, I guarantee you, I'm doing all, the, all that's required from a press all right. to deliver. It, is there not a case, something was made to start by Keane and others, and Keane was from this too, and we said about access in Europe, we mentioned the Rising Fund, and if our own government is doddering or is not, are there any European avenues in Keane? Is that an area where not giving a competitive advantage to anybody before we can get more EU investment. Well, I think it's important that the, like, if you look at China, for example, and, and some of the digital issues, uh, let's take one of the biggest growing technologies, which is the idea of artificial intelligence. And there's a big race at the moment between the United States and China to become leaders in artificial intelligence, and the criticisms of the EU is falling behind because there isn't a coordinated response. And I think there's the EU still, even though it doesn't have nearly the same number of uh, people and, and, and hence data as China and, and even to some extent in a lot of ways the United States, um, I think what the EU can do and what Ireland needs to be involved in uh, straight away is having a coordinated set of standards. And that's where the EU is actually quite good at leading on things. With trade policy, um, with even agriculture and environment policy, the EU will not always allow um, short-term economic gains uh, to be at the expense of, of having high standards for citizens, for workers, 
and I think it's really important that we are part of a coordinated European <coughs> response because we can actually be leaders. Because you will notice, I guarantee, in 40, 50 years, countries like China, and um, hopefully when they democratize a little bit, the people saying, okay, we actually want to be, uh, our government to be held to a higher standard, and the EU uh, will be looked at to be the leader of that. And we already are in, um, in a lot of data protection issues with our new uh, data protection. Other countries are copying the EU regulations. Okay. Even though they don't have to. Right, yeah, I'm conscious of the time we have. Oh, there was a lady over here and then a gentleman there. And we'll finish up with the two, if that's okay. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. My name is Peter Murphy, and I'm with the Green Party. And I was also glad to hear you kick off with the, um, the plastics. And I'm very glad to Europe for bring, that it is going to bring in the ban on single use plastics. Because God knows we don't seem to have the political will for it in this country. But my question is, when we come along to functions like this, why, or oh why, or oh why are we presented with plastic bottles of water? Five of them up on the top table tonight. Not a month ago, I was uh, at a function in the mayor's office, and I gave him an earful about it as well, because we had, we had plastic bottles and plastic um, receptacles at that one. The one word centre here in Waterford ran a really good campaign on banning plastics, or reducing plastics with the businesses in town. They got everybody on board. They got a five-point plan passed by the council to reduce the use of plastics. And at the risk of sounding ungracious, it was very nice to come in on such a cold night and be gracious with a hot cup of tea. But please, can we get rid of the plastic bottles and such a Thank you. Okay, we would say that to the museum providers, right? Are those glasses plastic? Yeah, it's coming in the back. 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 Just go back to Sean's question there. If they got more foreign students, some of this investment could get a return. If, they, if the government were prepared to put 700 million into it, they got a lot of foreign students coming in, they'd get a return. But sometimes the model is the government says, let cardiac care, show us the demand, and then we'd be given the money to the nurse's pupil. Um, you know, if your institute, your university, has not got the infrastructure, the capacity, the staff, the funding, and you bring people over, to Willie's point, you will look bad, you will fail. Mm. So surely we do need the money for some go yeah. yeah, okay, you're right, okay. There's a gentleman here, just to finish off, thanks, cheers. Good evening, my name is Raul, I'm Spanish, so yeah. I do like the European Union, I myself, yeah. I am using the, the free movement uh, right in half. Yeah. Raul, how did you come to Waterford? Tell me, how are you using the free movement? Tell us, what brought you to Waterford? Uh, I'm a medical devices engineer and working in the medical devices industry, so uh -huh. okay. probably that's <laughs> um, I have a question that uh, I do recognize that um, some regulation is, is needed to keep everything working, but uh, is there a party here in Ireland asking itself if how, how much integration is too much? How much regulation is too much? Well, well, we're, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Regulation yeah. integration. Oh, integration. Oh, integration. Integration. Sorry, okay. Well, uh, regulations yeah. are a consequence yeah. of integration, I think. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you're saying Spain has had a migrant crisis uh, you know, on your shores and so forth. What's your point? What are you actually saying? Are you saying there's too many immigrants coming in? Well, why? Because I don't, I'm not quite sure what you're saying. Uh, again, how much integration is too yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, there is no right answer to this question, but maybe uh, the answer is in the middle of Europe, in a country that doesn't belong to the European Union. Switzerland, I mean. Uh, they have 26 cantons and each one of them has some autonomy. Maybe if we copy some kind of something of this of their system, maybe the answer will come by itself. If you ask me about the immigration, yeah. I would say uh, who is coming, in which numbers, and why? Because what we don't have is, is well, actually, maybe 20% of the Spanish population right now is immigrants. And most of them, uh, the country is working for them, and the, and the, and the people is working for the country, no problem, most of them. But some of them can't integrate into the into the country. They don't speak the language. They don't have any skills, and they're they're coming in a huge number that it's impossible to integrate all. Of them. 
Yeah, okay, and that's so that would be my answer. Yeah, sure, yeah, because you said integration, and I push you in immigration because I think they're intrinsically linked. And sometimes the questions that's put as integration has a, has a deeper theme underneath it, and I think immigration might be one of those. Uh, Keen, would you like to address that? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back after the answer. Okay. Yeah, well, I think the answer to how much integration too much is when it's not beneficial anymore. Like, and that, that the point of, of you know, EU integration is, um, and really touched on it a few times, it's, it's about doing things together that we just can't do by ourselves. Um, and there are so many issues that that is important for, um, uh, I, you know, in terms of digital, but also in terms of climate change, in terms of, uh, some people would say in terms of defence cooperation. Um, and when you start integrating the things that actually you could do better um, by having different um, different countries doing their own policy, well then that's what I would interesting. But is this essential? Does Neural make a very good point? When we look at and you can give different labels for it, populism, right winger. When we look at the fate that's befallen Angela Merkel and her policy on immigration, is that not a threat to this, again, this European dream idea that we have? And it's the elephant in the room. No, actually, I think, well, if you're looking at immigration, like it's, it's, it's not a threat to the European dream at all, it is the European dream. Um, and, but it's um, not working, though, is it? I don't know. Well, which, which point is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, it's also um, a sharing of the burden, I'd say. So in terms of uh, the migrants that were coming through to um, to Italy, into Greece, mm. into northern um, Morocco, and Spain, to Clay, yeah. Manila, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, maybe that the way it's been done is not uh, is creating the problem. Mm. So what do you do with Greece? So that's where you share the burden. So that we, we in the other countries, so instead of having holding tanks or mm -hmm. holding areas, that, mm -hmm. that the, those who need the support, we need, we need the employment with the economy growing and we need the skills. They're very yeah, it's skills. very interesting because I've been really so in there, I was looking at UK wage inflation and since they cut, you know, less people coming in, wages are going up really interesting. Farmers are giving out a case. Sorry, but you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, our, Ireland is very sick. Successful example of integration of immigration because people have come with skill sets and uh, they've contributed to the But really, we need people in direct provision camps living off the less. Yes, now, that's that's it. And, and that's a different question. I think this is the, pro is mm -hmm. the problem that is that we need to solve. Most people want to stay in their own country. Mm -hmm. Most people want to live in their own country. They don't want to come to a place where they don't speak the language, mm -hmm. where, where they feel alienated. The problem with uh, the migration is the cause of that. Globalization is cause and we need to address globalization in the negative sense. I mean globalization at the positive sense, but what I mean is that you know we've got to look at how to create employment in those countries, create sustainable societies. The very same thing that Europe is trying to create for Europe. The second thing is that um, the direct direct provision is the, is, is the pollination because you have people spending years and years and years. I mean, we get, I'll give an example, we get every week a request from people who are in uh, these care centres who can't go to third level education. Yeah. A, they can't pay for it, right? So, but for Europe, Europe cannot solve the problems of the world. But what Europe can do with the US and other areas is to look at how we address the cause of this mass migration. Because it's an economic migration in the main. And what globalization has failed to do is to create sustainable societies in all of these areas. Other areas, it's war. So Europe has to be much more, uh, um, let's say, play a much stronger role at addressing some of these key, key problems. Okay, Kieran, you want to come in? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a series of Muslim and Muslim workers. Fallen population, birth rates are down. And, uh, and Germany took in a lot of people because they really need to reskill and they need, they need new people to work for the short of the yeah. Short yeah. So it can't always be a negative thing. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have a very brief yeah. 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 So do you mind if we just get the microphone because we'll be recording this and we'd like to get your... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. 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 
Yeah, and one other thing in training students and help with the art department and economy. For the last 14 years and plus, French students and Spanish students come in here for the summer to learn English. All right, it's just as good to our economy. I mean, I know certain families depend on it to come to be able to afford to send our kids back to school when they go back in September. So it's income the whole time, even from the city's point of view here. Every Saturday, if anyone had lost you, I had them sit for years in Austria, and they were a pleasure to have them. They were a pleasure that we're still in contact with some of them. Some of them come back and visit myself, my wife, my family. But apart from that, from the city's point of view, we'd send every Saturday, maybe four bus to Cork on Saturday, to spend money down at Cork. And Cork had sent four bus to the water. And it's fantastic to see them on the keys. Us, the students come in every Saturday to spend their couple of pounds here in the city. So we're doing this for the lifetime. And it's helping so economically benefit the families in Water City and throughout the country. It's essential that we keep that going. And something that goes on our living. Okay, so that, thanks so much for that. Thank you. All right, so we're going to um, wrap it up. Um, I want to thank as well um, everybody from the Institute of International and European Affairs, particularly Stephanie the last one, Keen, thank you, Minion. A big thanks to our pally panel, to Willie, to Kieran, and to Grace. To you for coming in. It's, it's been a long evening, but I think it certainly has opened my mind up to a, a lot of different things. I want to thank a big thanks to, to Darren Mariarty, to Hannah Deasy, to Nancy, all the gang here. Uh, from the Institute who made this possible tonight. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>